Kevin, thanks again for meeting us. My um, pleasure. Great to be here. I would love to hear you retell us the story of your experience in Iraq in 2004. Sure. It's you know been over 10 years now, but Fallujah 2004, November, it was one of the first uh, major battles in the war in Iraq. And in fact, it was the largest battle that most U.S. forces had seen since the Battle of Hue in Vietnam um, back in the 1960s, the mid-60s. And at that time, the U.S. forces were trying to dislodge the insurgents that had controlled the city. And they were amassing on the outskirts, getting ready to push in. Um, there was a lot of artillery used to kind of soften up the city beforehand. Uh, there were announcements that were made to tell anyone that was not a combatant to flee the city, uh, very similar to what we're seeing right now in the battle for Mosul. Uh, to try to get people to leave there because it was going to be a hellish battle. There was really going to be nothing left when they were done and they were eager to go in and, and really make sure that the control of the city was firmly in the hands of allied forces and the Iraqi government. So there were two or three days of this softening up and there were a series over a course of, of uh, about a month beforehand of what they call feints where uh, U.S. and its allies would go in and they would intend uh, to attack an area to pretend that was the major uh, offensive and just to get the insurgents in that area to redirect their forces. Um, and then in the, the process of doing that, they would, um, through attrition, uh, kill some of those insurgents, but also uh, demoralize them. So in the time period that I went in, uh, in the actual attack, um, there had been some of this softening up. And then w by the time I came in with uh, a group of U.S. Marines, I was embedded with the Marines for about a month beforehand, uh, the city seemed almost empty when we came in. In fact, it was like a ghost town. So we thought maybe those feints had driven the insurgents out. Maybe they had just given up and that you know, they, they were afraid. But there, there didn't seem to be anybody there with the exception of a few bodies. And I remember very clearly you know, going in and seeing decapitated bodies that had been killed by U.S. Marine snipers, uh, some, you know, some people still bleeding in the streets, um, mostly military-age males. But at a certain point in this, um, in this movement towards the center of the city, we realized we weren't alone. Uh, we started taking fire from insurgents from different uh, positions, and the Marines really began to take casualties at that point. Uh, and, and even with a small number of, of insurgents left in the city, it became a, this major battle, you know, a, a lot of fighting. Um, and one of the things that the U.S. Marines did that they hadn't done before uh, in this fighting in Iraq was they decided that they would, if they took fire from mosques, they would return fire at those mosques. It was a, a terrible PR nightmare for them because if you're, you're shooting at a religious uh, building, you know, there's really no way to justify that except saying they were shooting at us first. But they, they decided that would be part of their policy at that point. They would not take casualties uh, if people were going to shoot at them from those mosques. So when I came in, um, one of the major battles that happened there uh, about mid-November uh, was um, th this fighting to take a mosque in South Fallujah. And when this happened, the, the U.S. Marines went in and there was a, a firefight that ended up with about 10 insurgents being killed in that mosque and five that were just wounded and they were left with inside the mosque. And when I followed the Marines in there, uh, I think it was the 13th of November, um, it, it was a, a terrible sight to see. I, would just, I remember it was one of the most destructive um, visions that I had seen in all of my years of covering war. Ten uh, mutilated bodies on the, on the ground that had been pretty much cut down with uh, uh, machine gun fire. And then dotting the sides of the mosque were five individuals that were still alive but were suffering from a series of, of injuries, some of them very severe that they didn't look like they were going to last the night, some of them not so severe. And um, I remember asking um, the commander of the battalion who came in later, what's going to happen to these guys? And, and at that point they were being treated by Navy corpsmen, which are the medics that, that follow the Marines. And they said, well, we're going to treat them, and of course we'll take them back to our battalion headquarters and, and we'll interrogate them. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, we left that evening after you know, this had all taken place. And then the next day, we heard gunfire coming from the mosque again. 
And so the unit that I was with, was with came back into the mosque area. And it seemed to be very chaotic. You know, I know we, we see movies about war, and it seems like everybody knows exactly what they're doing. They're going this direction or that direction. But there was a lot of shooting going on, um, but no one seemed to be able to explain it. And then, you know, most acutely, there was a bit of silence and then a series of individual shots. Bang. 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 Those intervals with a few seconds, maybe a second or two in between them, which isn't what you expect in a combat situation. You expect to hear fire and then return fire. And so we were very curious about what was going on and finally went into the mosque um, and found a group of Marines, a uh, different group of Marines that had been in there the night before. But we're in there now and all of those five men that I had seen that were wounded um, the night before were now bleeding again from new wounds. Uh, they had been shot again while they were in there. The dead bodies were still there. None of this had been cleaned up. And as I followed the, the lieutenant um, for this specific platoon into the mosque, um, I, I asked him, I said, Lieutenant, what the hell happened here? I mean, these guys were supposed to be evacuated, and here they are, they're shot again. You know, I thought that there had been some kind of mistaken identity, that another group of Marines came in and thought they were hostiles. He left and he got on the radio to find out what was going on. And while I was there, um, I began shooting. One of the men uh, was an older man, 67, maybe 70, and he was bleeding very profusely. And in fact, there was blood coming out of his nose and it was bubbling out. It was just, it was a, a terrible thing. And I remember just kind of kneeling down beside him and shooting and almost just conditioned to do so. I, I mean, I, I didn't know how to explain what had happened there and I just wa I wanted to capture all of it and the Marines didn't seem to care that I was there. And then I see out of the corner of my eye, a Marine pointing a weapon and another one of the insurgents, again, one of the guys that had been wounded the night before but had been, you know, again, shot prior to me coming in there. And I hear the Marine say, he's faking he's fucking dead. He's fucking faking he's dead and he raises his M16 and fires off around. And I just remember his head exploding against the back wall and that proverbial pink mist that we always hear about, just spraying the back of the, this mosque wall. And it was a terrible moment. And, and my reaction was, was even stranger because from that point, I panned over from the, the guy that I had been shooting to what had happened. And I held the shot for a little bit, for a couple of seconds, and as a, a videographer, I'm trained to pan back in the other direction, and I remember doing exactly that, and I don't know why. Uh, and then I got up and I confronted the Marine. I said, what are you doing? You know, these were the guys that were in here from yesterday. And he simply said, you know, I didn't know, sir. I didn't know. And then he left. And, and that it was a really strange reaction because he didn't know what. He didn't know they were, you know, insurgents that had been wounded the day before. He, he didn't know if they posed a danger, all of those things. But the footage that I captured, it just, I had a pit in my stomach and it, I had never seen anything like it. You know, I had seen death before um, and certainly, you know, in all the conflicts that I'd covered, um, you know, it, it's the common denominator, but I hadn't seen it that close and I hadn't seen it without really provocation. Now, the, the controversy that came up after that was, you know, were these Marines acting in self-defense? Were they afraid that they were going to be killed by these insurgents in there? And that might have been going through their mind. The problem is, at the very least, if that was the case, they didn't follow normal protocol. Normal protocol for any U.S. forces when they suspect someone might be playing dead, you know, or, or, or pose a danger when they're wounded, is you do a dead check. You know, you put a, a bayonet, a knife on the end of your rifle, and you poke them in a very sensitive area, in the groin or in the eyeball, and if they flinch, they're certainly still alive. If they don't, they, can't, they can withstand that kind of pain, they're probably dead. None of that happened. And also, normally, if you, you're in fear that there could be an improvised explosive device, an IED, or that these guys could be booby-trapped somehow, you clear everybody out. None of that happened. And again, these are young Marines. Um, but they had quite a bit of experience at that point, especially with this battle. None of that was done. And perhaps most telling was the way that he shot him. He, he basically aimed his rifle, shot him, and then 
didn't check anything else, didn't check any of the other bodies, just kind of turned on his heels and walked away, almost like it was an exclamation point. And that bothered me a great deal. Um, and, and what became, I guess, most important in the video that I shot was that no one saw that movement. Almost no one in the United States saw what had happened during the shooting and in the aftermath. Now with that videotape, you know, I was very conflicted about it. Um, I wondered if we aired this, are there going to be more deaths? Are insurgents not going to surrender? Are they going to become, um, you know, in, in some ways, will there be revenge killings for, for what was happening here? And eventually I came to the conclusion, you know, you, you have to tell the truth in this. But instead of telling the full truth, we told a half truth. We censored the video. Um, and we provided it to the pool. I was providing uh, footage to all of the, uh, the networks at that point. It was a share situation for all of our competitors, ABC, NBC, CBS, Al Jazeera, BBC. Everybody got the same footage, and we got their footage. But we offered two versions, the full and censored raw version, and a censored version where we stopped it just as he raised his rifle. So you never saw the most significant aspects of it. And the most significant aspects were what had happened when he fired his weapon, and what did the insurgent look like? Was he doing something? Was he moving? He wasn't doing any of those things. And what did the Marine look like after he fired his weapon? Was he cautious? Was he checking things out? Or as I mentioned, he spun on his heels and walked out in almost a bit of triumphalism. So almost all of the U.S. networks, I, no, I should say this, all of the U.S. networks took the censored version of the video. They had both of them, but they aired only the censored version. All of our overseas partners, BBC, Al Jazeera, all of the, the French networks, everybody that got the raw footage aired that. Um, some of them without context, without saying what was going on. I provided a reporting package explaining the details of it, um, but the US networks didn't show that. And, and to me, that was our biggest mistake, because in doing so, um, we're there to be witnesses to war, and gratuitous violence has no context in some ways. You know, watching ISIS behead someone, you don't have to see their intent. But in this particular case, you know, whether the Marine was afraid for his life, whether those insurgents posed any threat to him, and how he reacted in the aftermath of the shooting said, you know, volumes about the intent and the environment that was there, and they needed those images for context, and we didn't provide them. And the real irony here is that these were American military um, individuals. You know, these were U.S. Marines, and yet Americans were the only ones in the world that didn't see what their military had done in this particular instance. They needed to see that. That's the whole reason that we're there is to provide context, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, you know, whether you know, he tried to treat that man for his injuries or he shot him point blank as he did, either of those narratives is fair game and we have to be able to report them accurately and truthfully and in cases where it's necessary, provide the visual context. You know, and unfortunately we didn't do it in that case. How would you explain the reasons as to why only the edited version appeared on American television? It's easy to explain why the actual uh, raw footage didn't appear on American television. Ever since the Vietnam War, uh, there has been a reaction within both military echelons and within government echelons and within the U.S. public as well that the images that came out of Vietnam in some ways compromised the war effort. We were seeing young you know, men bleeding in the fields of, in the jungles of Vietnam, and that was coming into our living rooms. Um, because basically, journalists at that point could travel anywhere they wanted. They could hop on a helicopter with any soldier. There was no embedding. They could go anywhere they wanted, do what they needed to do. And they were you know, eventually shipping that, that film and, and the footage off to their networks, and it was coming to the, into the living rooms of the American public. And so there was a reaction against it. Uh, many people think it really hastened the end of that war. And so for the Pentagon, you know, there's um, you know, a real problem there. We want to be able to show the heroism of, of our 
you know, boys fighting overseas, yet at the same time, you know, we don't want to show them getting killed and blown up. Um, that, that really demoralizes the public and, and may undercut the war effort. And the same thing for the government. And so what they decided to do, um, the first uh, bite back at the apple was the U.S. Um, the U.S. fighting in the, uh, in the first Gulf War where Saddam Hussein had invaded Iraq and the U.S. created a coalition to force him out. But basically, the, the media was frozen out of that completely. There were no images of fighting, you know, almost zero, uh, except the highway of death later on where you saw all of those burnt corpses of Iraqis fleeing out of Kuwait. But basically, it was a, a video game war. It was sterilized. And people were very angry. You know, the media was angry. The public was angry in some ways. You know, and, and the Pentagon realized we're also not getting our story told. So the solution to this was the embedding process. Um, when the U.S. got involved in Afghanistan and then subsequently in 2003 got involved in Iraq, um, the military knew that they had to somehow accommodate the media. And I remember you know, one general telling me that the media is like the rain. It's like the weather. It's going to be there whether you want it to be or not. And so we've got to find a way to tell our story while allowing them to be you know, there and, and not to compromise the work that we're doing. So the embedding process was kind of genius. Um, it basically put journalists within these units and you know, let them travel with them and, and videotape what they were doing, report on what they were doing. And you know, there was a very cunning aspect to this on behalf of the Pentagon, and that was, in doing so, they, they co-opted the journalists. Um, you're, you're spending time with these young men and women um, that are really likable in many ways. I mean, there's certainly sociopaths and psychopaths in any big institution, and the military, U.S. military is no exception. But you know, for the most part, you like these kids. And I remember personally lending them my satellite phone, talking to them, you know, sharing a cigarette, doing whatever it is you do to hang out with them to get a better story and personalize it. And then when you see one of them get wounded or killed, you're angry too. You've taken a side. Um, and also, you're, you're very afraid to show them doing something they aren't supposed to do. Uh, and I think good journalism still came out of the embedding process because, you know, deep in our hearts, we're journalists first. You know, and I remember a journalist telling me, write on your notepad, you're not one of them, you're not one of them, you're not one of them. You know, it was great advice. Uh, it's hard to do in the field. And so I think the Pentagon got lots of good coverage and lots of heroic stuff, especially during the invasion of Iraq, crossing that desert. You know, it was almost like the flight of the Valkyries um, in Apocalypse Now. Um, you know, where the colonel is, is coming in with his helicopters and you hear the, the sound of, you know, this operatic crescendo of music and then the explosions and it was just all, all of the mythology of war that we've come to embrace in popular culture. And here it was happening for real. But then there's footage like mine that shows the other side of it, the darker side, and not more realistic, but just as realistic, you know, equal parts of this. Um, and it's harder for the public to embrace that, and it's much harder for them to imagine that one of their guys is going to commit a war crime, is going to commit rape, is going to uh, kill extrajudicially. And I remember the, the battalion commander saying to me, we're the good guys. We don't behead. We don't treat you know, people poorly. We don't torture. Well, we know those things are not true. Of course, every army tortures. You know, every, arm or com every army commits atrocities. Um, and we had, in some ways, bought into the Pentagon's vision of war rather than you know, the truer vision of war and, and spoon-fed the American public these images. And so they don't want to see them anymore. They don't want to see the bad things. They don't want to see American soldiers getting killed um, or wounded. And that's why um, it's very rare to see that. You won't see them committing atrocities, partly because it's harder you know, to gain access to that. I, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, was there when one happened. But you know, just as, as difficult is the process of showing a wounded American, and that happens. You know, the irony is it is the ultimate sacrifice. So in some ways, it should reinforce the, uh, the ideal that these guys are giving in their all. But at the same time, there's that old Vietnam mentality that it's going to undermine the morale of the war and the war effort. So, but the embedding process was, 
you know, I think kind of genius, but it did have mixed results. We were able to get to the truth in some cases, but in other cases, perhaps the appetite of the public has already been conditioned just to see you know, the apocalypse now version.